Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'd like to talk to you about the non-specific defense of our body. Yeah, you know, it's interesting about our, our uh, defensive systems of our body. When I say defensive system, I mean the cells, the chemicals, the, the skin, all of these things uh, collectively are trying to defend ourselves against uh, disease-causing agents or pathogens. But it's sort of interesting. It's sort of like I, if I can make a, a sport analogy right out of the gate. It's kind of like when you're playing defense and you don't know, like for example in a, in a football game, uh, if you don't know what the other team's going to do, you're going to run something sort of like a just a generic uh, prevent defense. You don't know if they're going to run or they're going to pass. So our body has something similar to that. We have something called a non-specific defense system. And then if you know, if you've seen a particular germ before, our body remarkably has a memory for that. And, and that's called the specific immune response. And so that discussion is going to come up in a separate video. But I, today I'd like to talk to you, and let's get right into that conversation. Today I'd like to talk to you about this sort of generic or non-specific defense. And so this picture that you can see here is a scanning electron micrograph of bacterial cells. And it's just one example of a uh, some kind of germ uh, that can cause difficulty. We could have uh, foreign proteins, we could have fungi, we can have parasites, we can have bacteria. So all these disease-causing agents are called pathogens. And so we have a, a defense against these things. And so we have to defend against all these unwelcome intruders, and they can be potentially dangerous. Some of these viruses and bacteria can be almost lethal in some instances. And so we call them pathogens or disease-causing agents. And we encounter them all the time. Some of them live on our skin. Sometimes we breathe it in. Sometimes someone coughs on us or someone sneezes on us. Sometimes it's found on, on food, surprisingly. And so this may be obvious, but this is why we would want to uh, cook our food and clean our food. And so it can also be found in water. And so all of these germs are try to, trying to get us. And so we have this incredible uh, system of defense. And the, and the defensive systems work in cooperation with one another. And the truth is, in this particular video, I'm, gonna, I'm going to look at non-specific defense. And then uh, in a, a separate video, as I mentioned, we'll talk about specific defense and, or memory, which is our immune system. But the truth is, all of these things work together in order to fight off pathogens. But two of them are certainly nonspecific, meaning that they're unable to distinguish between one infectious agent and another. So it doesn't care what kind of virus it is. Our, uh, our body doesn't care what type of bacteria it is. It just recognizes it as foreign and therefore takes care of it. And so we have something called the first line of defense. And so the idea here with the first line of defense is, if I could just summarize this, is just keep it out. <laughs> keep pathogens out. Keep out. When you see a sign like that, keep out. So this is a good type of defense. If we can keep pathogens out of our body, in other words, the skin is, is fairly impermeable. Now, as you know, uh, we've all received a cut sometime in our lives. Sometimes the cutaneous layer, and that's why it's called cut, is compromised and then germs get in. But if, we are, if our skin's intact, uh, mucous membranes, which line the inside of our, our mouth and our whole digestive system, um, and also uh, part of the rectum uh, and urinary tract, uh, prevents organisms from getting in. And not only uh, the mucous membrane and skin, uh, but also some of the secretions of the skin, some of the oils and uh, saliva uh, are, have chemicals in them. One in particular uh, called lysozyme helps to destroy bacteria on the skin. Uh, the pH is not con conducive to maximum growth. Some of the oils make it difficult for bacteria to grow on the skin. But if the first line of defense is penetrated, we have a group of white blood cells, just generically, and this is what the video is going to get into in particular, generically called phagocytes, which are cells that are going to engulf uh, foreign invaders or pathogens. And we also have a whole set of different proteins that, are, uh, that help uh, fight off viruses and bacteria. 
And then we have something called the inflammatory response, and that's going to be discussed in this video as well, inflammatory response. We've all always, all of us have had a cut, and it's been sort of swelling and red and pain, and so I want to talk about what that is all about. And then in a separate video, we'll talk about the, the specific immune system, or third line of defense. And so the non-defense uh, is sort of external, and, it's so, and it comprises of the epithelial cells that cover and line our body, in the secretions that are produced. And so here in the nasal cavity, this is considered to be first line of defense, though you're thinking, well, this is on the, you know, the inside of the body. Uh, sure it is, but the truth is we also have uh, the ability to fight off and make sure that things don't penetrate. And li likewise, the whole digestive system, though internal, is kind of considered to be like outside of the realm of the body as well. And so we have this defensive system. And so our skin and the, and the mucus uh, membranes provide the first line of barrier to, the, to an infection. And so usually uh, bacteria can't penetrate the skin. And so there's many layers of stratified squamous epithelium. And unless there's some kind of an abrasion or, or penetration, uh, microorganisms cannot uh, permeate through the skin. But likewise, in the mucous membrane, like for example, say this was the nasal cavity again. So this is a picture, let me go back. This is like inside the nasal cavity right here, and this is what I'm talking about, mucous membranes. Um, this is the mucosal layer. It's some, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of mucus here. I mean, let's draw some mucus coming out right in here. Reason that there's mucus is that there's specific cells called goblet cells that are secreting that. And then we have these proteins on the outside of cell called cilia that will help to capture uh, pathogens. Let me make a new color for, for the germs that are trying to get into our nasal cavity. And they'll get caught up into that. And then the cilia sweeps them down the pharynx and then ultimately into the esophagus, which then they'll travel to the stomach. And the stomach is quite awesome at defending the body because the, the majorly low pH that's in there created by hydrochloric acid will destroy more, most organisms. So this is a good defense, uh, keeping germs out, the mucous membranes. And then I mentioned some of the chemicals that are just coming up onto the skin, like even sweat, like in, in sebaceous glands, the oil that secretes the sebe uh, sebum will come out and it's kind of acidic and that prevents uh, bacteria from really taking hold or certain kinds of bacteria. The truth is, not all bacteria on our skin are pathogenic or harmful. We have actually a beneficial bacteria, which are, it's kind of good because that competes uh, with the pathogenic bacteria. So you don't overly want to like nuke your skin by uh, uh, constantly cleansing it with like um, antibacterial uh, soaps and uh, uh, gels and that sort of thing. Just light soap and, and water is, is, is good. So again, the sweat and, and the oil prevent uh, microorganisms from growing onto the skin. So this is kind of a chemical defense. And then interestingly enough, in our saliva and in our tears, uh, the cells produce this enzyme called lysozyme. And as the name might imply, if, if you're familiar with these uh, prefixes, lyso means, or lysis means to destroy. And so this is an antiseptic type of enzyme that will destroy bacterial cell walls. And so this is kind of good. So we have this sort of uh, antiseptic enzyme that's present in our saliva and tears, which will help to destroy uh, pathogenic bacteria in, uh, on the skin. And, and again, the mucus that is secreted by goblet cells accumulates here on the outside. It's coming out of the goblet cells. And then it'll, get, it'll trap uh, microbes here and then the cilia will then move them uh, out of the respiratory system. For example, move, if say say we breathe in some germs and it's in our trachea, they'll get caught up into the mu in the mucus, and so this will cause all of those germs to then come back out, and then we'll be able to swallow them and destroy them. And so this, as you can see here, this is an example of pseudostratified ciliated columnar cells, which is which make up the mucous membrane of the respiratory system, and uh, they're nonspecific. Awesome picture of the cilia found on those cells that help to sweep the microbes out of 
the respiratory bronchial tree, preventing them from entering into the lungs where they can cause damage. So this cilia is actually this cilia right here that you see on the outside of the cell. It's pretty awesome. This is the light microscope. This is obviously a drawing. And then this is the scanning electron micrograph. And so I'm going to give a big shout out for the stomach because in my opinion, the major role of the stomach is that of defense. I mean, of course, you know, the, uh, the enzymes, uh, the protein digesting enzyme pepsin is found there and it begins the digestion of protein. But that highly acidic environment in the stomach is so, so critical at destroying many, many, many microbes. It, it's constantly preventing um, infection from occurring. And so it does such a wonderful job. Now, there are some exceptions to this. Like, for example, if you were to eat uh, food that, like food poisoning, something that really had a, a large number of bacteria on it, it might be able to get through the stomach and cause uh, some problems. And there are some other things, like some viruses that cause hepatitis A uh, can, can uh, survive during the, this acidic environment. And there's also some bacteria that are uh, acid, acid uh, tolerant, uh, pylori, he, uh, he, 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 H. pylori bacteri bacteria, I believe I'm, I have that right, is able to survive uh, the stomach acid and therefore uh, is associated with uh, stomach ulcers. But that, those are the exceptions. Most microbes uh, come to the end of their life when they, when they encounter the stomach. Now, one of the, the major nonspecific defenses, uh, and, and it's considered to be second line, say, say for example, you've had a cut and there's some germs that are entering into, uh, into the skin. And in this case, this is a picture of the, of the blood. But if you have some bacteria, and I'll just say, use that as an example of a pathogen, you have some bacteria, that a white blood cell and, it, and if you know your white blood cells, you might recognize this one as being a monocyte. Now, a monocyte is an agranular type of uh, leukocyte, and it's really good at phagocytosis. And so let me try to animate this. What's going to happen is the white blood cell is going to come very close to the bacteria like this, and it's going to recognize it as being foreign. Now, it doesn't recognize it specifically, but it does recognize it as being foreign. Now, how, how does it go about doing that? And so, it, let me draw that a little bit larger. There's specific proteins that are found on the outside of cell membranes, on all living things. And if the white blood cell doesn't recognize those proteins, it considers them foreign. And as it turns out, the white blood cell itself, the phagocyte, let me draw it like this, also has these little receptor proteins on the outside. And if they encounter something that is foreign, this will initiate a response so that the cell membrane, which is fluid, as you may know, will, let me take that a step over. So this is like step one, that it encounters it like this. And then step two would be that the whole white blood cell takes it all the way around, sort of like a Pac-Man, like this, if you remember that old video game. It, it completely engulfs the foreign organism such that, because this is too large to, to diffuse across the cell membrane, it takes it in and then these two pieces right here of the cell membrane will then fuse together like that. And let me see if I can do that. We'll fuse in together. And what you've created is the sort of food vacuole or a, a lysosome, a lysozyme or a, just a vesicle that has the germ inside. And what will then happen is that inside the white blood cell, which is right here, there's an organelle called a lysosome. Let me write that out, lysosome. And so you might know this. Um, this, this is a organelle that's found that it has hydrolytic enzymes. So these are digestive proteins that are in here. And so what will happen is these two things will fuse together like that and these digestive enzymes will come in and sort of take apart and destroy like that. It'll break it up in many little pieces. Uh, and then that is small enough to where it'll, it'll diffuse out. And so ultimately, this is what we call phagocytosis, where a white blood cell will come and dominate. Uh, but these cells are sort of indiscriminate. In other words, they're going to they're gonna engulf anything that's foreign. 
And it, it doesn't even have to be a, a bacteria, it could just be a foreign protein. But here's a white blood cell that's encountering some sort of germ, and here it's getting close to it, it's interacting with it, and then the membrane sort of engulfs it, and so it's sort of swallowing all of these things. And so uh, this is what happens when uh, foreign invaders try to penetrate the body. Phagocytes come along and engulf them like that. So it's kind of interesting. And so, again, another cool picture of that. So here's the white blood cell, and it's these are all the bacteria. And so that's, that's what's happening. Again, if I were to illustrate that, um, I would show like the white blood cell simply in, surrounding the foreign organism. In this case, it's a green little guy like that. And so this is the process of phagocytosis. Um, it's, it's sort of, uh, you know, you can get into the detail of it. Uh, I, I'll try to resist not, but these little receptors will attach onto it and it's known as, uh, um, it's taking it in or endocytosis or a receptor mediated, receptor mediated endocytosis. But you can just simply call it phagocytosis in which the foreign organism is taken inside. And what's really remarkable about this is, let me sort of just draw this green guy in here. I find this part to be kind of interesting. Once it goes inside like this, and I was mentioning, then it's broken up by a lysosome, okay? And so it's being digested. And so check this out. All these little pieces of the bacteria are then, whoops, let me go green on this. All these little pieces of the bacteria are then being broken up right there and digested. What's totally interesting is that this white blood cell is capable of taking some of these fragments of the bacteria and attaching them to proteins that the white blood cell makes itself. Okay, and you're like, well, what's going on with this? And then these proteins are then placed on the outside of the, of the plasma membrane like this. And then these little bacterial proteins are displayed, or can I use this word presented, on the outside of the white blood cell? Sort of like cradling it. Almost like an analogy, this is kind of silly, may sound silly, but it's almost like um, a fighter airplane, like in the, in, in the Air Force, would put like little stickers on the outside of the plane uh, signifying um, the number of enemy aircraft that it that it's shot down. But it's not showing off. These are not necessarily like little trophies or, um, or but basically it's displaying a little piece of the bacteria. And these proteins that are out here um, are referred to as antigens. Okay, so they, they're going to invoke an antibody generated response, but I'm not gonna get into that. But what this is gonna do is when the white blood cell circulates in the body, there's other types of white blood cells called lymphocytes that are very helpful in the immune system. And so if the immune system encounters a foreign antigen, that's great, but there's not very many lymphocytes in the body. There are certainly a diversity of them, but they're not numerous. And so as it turns out, when a white blood cell presents, or if you call this an antigen presenting cell, when the, when the white blood cell presents these foreign proteins from the bacteria that it's been eating, another type of white blood cell can come along and determine that there's trouble or an infection in the house by encountering an antigen presenting cell. So it's really, really useful in terms of amplifying uh, the response to foreign invaders. Okay, so when microorganisms penetrate the body, the first uh, defense is this phagocytosis, again, this engulfing foreign organisms. And so here's a sort of a cartoon of that. Here's the bacteria and sort of the membrane is stretching out. So it's interesting when scientists first saw this under the microscope, uh, you, can, you can view this. It's almost as if they had the, the cells had like little legs that were extending out or little feet that are extending out and they were uh, referred to as pseudopodia, stretching out and engulfing. And so this is associated with the inflammatory response because this is what's happening when germs get into the, the skin, for example. The phagocytes are coming out and dominating these bacteria. And so 
What's interesting is the when I was mentioning the collection of these proteins on the outside of the cell, let me sort of re revisit this. And so here's the, the white blood cell like that. And again, the, the bacteria was inside and then it was it was broken up into little pieces. And what what is happening is the the white blood cell will attach little pieces of the bacteria to the outside of these proteins. And these proteins on the outside of the white blood cell, this is an antigen presenting cell, are referred to as, sorry for the complexity of this, but I'll, I'll go into this in a little bit more detail when I start making videos on the, uh, the immune system. But this is called major histocompatibility complex, or MHC, these proteins on the outside of the cells. And as it turns out, there's two classes of it. The ones that are on the outside of a white blood cell, this is what a white blood cell, by the way, is something called a class two complex. And I know that sounds kind of detailed, but it's actually significant because we'll be talking about our body marks our own cells, our own tissue with a class one marker. And this class two are found on white blood cells and they help to, again, amplify the uh, immune response because antigen presenting cells can tip off the lymphocytes that there's invaders uh, in the house. So that's what that is. Um, and so these class two MHC markers are found on the outside of white blood cells. And this is a, uh, a monocyte right here, which is can enlarge and become a macrophage. And so uh, antigen presenting cell, and it presents little pieces of bacteria on the outside to help the uh, response. So you may know a little bit about white blood cells. Let me ref refresh you on this and that the most common white blood cell of all is a neutrophil. It's a, it's a granulocyte and it's, it's uh, characterized by sort of sausage or lobed nuclei stained kind of red here in this picture. So it's most common. So most of our white blood cells are here and these are the ones that are ph uh, phagocytes. And so they come to an area and they start engulfing, as I showed you before in the previous slide, they start engulfing uh, microbes and they destroy it. Okay. And the monocyte is also capable of phagocytosis. And again, this is less common, 5%, but they can extend their pseudopodia out. And this again, a cool picture and grab and engulf foreign organisms and destroy them um, when they fuse uh, with the lysosome inside of them. And so here is a picture of a macrophage and this is in the blood. But you know, the truth is most phagocytosis occurs outside of the blood. And let me just emphasize that just because it's, it's that important. Now, if this is blood, this, these would be the endothelium cells that make up, let's say a capillary like that. So the blood's flowing here like that. And you're like, well, what's over here? These are just ordinary tissue cells right over here. And this is fluid here and fluid here. Now, bacteria are often found in the tissue, not found in the blood. And so it's incumbent upon the, the macrophages to actually leave the blood. And they can do that when they squeeze out of the, the cells that make up the blood, the smallest blood vessels. And so this, um, Phagocytosis is mostly occurring here in the, what's called the interstitial fluid, or the, just simply the fluid between the tissues. And so this is where most of that is, is going down in the tissue. And so I just want to point out a couple of things in that there are some exceptions to this phagocytosis. And so you may have heard of tuberculosis or TB. It's, it's quite a brutal, uh, uh, infection. It usually occurs in the lungs. And the one of the problems with this is that this particular germ is uh, resistant to lysosomal destruction. It's not only resistant to that, but it actually, uh, the bacteria can actually thrive inside of macrophages. And so it tends to uh, become a real, a real problem. And so heavy doses of antibiotics are needed to destroy tuberculosis. You don't want that. And so I also wanted to point out that uh, not only can these macrophages migrate out of the blood, they're particularly prevalent in certain tissue. Like for example, in the lungs, here's the alveolar air sacs of the lungs. 
we actually have macrophages present in the air sacs because it's kind of a common place where germs are going to be coming in. If they're able to penetrate uh, the pseudostratified ciliated columnar. We also have a lot of macrophages in our liver that help not only to destroy disease, but to sort of destroy worn out red blood cells. And they're found in the kidney. They're found in, in obviously in connective tissue that I was mentioning before in the tissue, found in the brain. And a lot of white blood cells are found in lymph nodes and found in the spleen. And those are, uh, and that's because the lymph carries lots of germs away from the tissue. So the, so the lymphatic capillaries are draining and then that's moving along lymphatic vessels and then the lymph nodes are destroying uh, the organisms. And so here's a picture of the lymph node. So there's all kinds of phagocytosis occurring inside the lymph nodes. It's also occurring inside the spleen mm -hmm. uh, and all throughout and all these other nodes. So there's about 600 lymph nodes. And this is also phagocytosis is also occurring in our, in our, um, our tonsils as well. And so, as I was mentioning, the germs, which are found in the tissue fluid, and it's like, well, how does, and, you know, what's the tissue fluid doing here in the first place? Well, the high pressure of the blood forces water out of the capillaries, and then this, this water then enters into lymphatic capillaries. And so then the germs move in a unidirectional fashion, and then they're destroyed by phagocytosis inside of a lymph node. And so the... The function of the lymphatic system is to help to clear tissue fluid of germs as well. But the lymph node also has uh, the immune system working in it as well, but I'm, this particular video is just looking at nonspecific. Although it's pretty cool, you can see, look at all these lymph nodes here. So the lymph has to pass through uh, numerous lymph nodes where they encounter macrophages. Also lymphocytes, but macrophages is what we're talking about, and those are cleansing the lymph of germs. And so here's a picture of the spleen, and then there's a lot of phagocytosis occurring in the spleen as well. They can destroy uh, bacteria, but they can also destroy worn out red blood cells, and that's kind of interesting. Now we have this other kind of white blood cell called an eosinophil. It's very rare. It, it, it also has these uh, granulocytes inside of them. And these, these um, stain particularly red under the microscope. And what's interesting about this is that these cells are particularly useful at attacking parasites. So again, just generic uh, eukaryotic worms or little small protozoa that are, that are entering into the body. These will uh, come close to the parasite and uh, discharge these uh, destructive enzymes from the cytoplasmic granules that they contain, and then it will s simply destroy. Now, an example of that is that this worm, cystosomyosin, difficult to say, can get into our body, um, and it's rather brutal. And so this is a parasitic worm that gets into the body, and so an eosinophil can come up right next to it and, and discard these uh, digestive granules and destroy it. Okay, and so now I want to draw our attention to inflammation. This is again part of the sort of the second line of defense, and it's part of the um, a non-specific immune response. We've all had this. We've all had this sort of pain, this swelling, this redness associated with inflammation. The name itself sort of implies that to inflame. Okay, so this is what we're we're talking about. Classic example of inflammation. And so why is it swollen? Well, it's clear that the fluid that's coming into this particular area is coming from the blood. So that's the source of the water that's coming in. So what must be happening, if you can predict this, is that the capillaries in the particular area of infection are uh, dilating, so vasodilation. So they're, they're becoming um, more leaky, if you will. And so it's a localized area so uh, an inflammatory response is when the cells are damaged. And when the cells are damaged, they release a series of chemicals that will signal a whole bunch of events to occur. And that is for the capillaries to dilate, which means they're more permeable. So more fluid will leave out of the capillaries. But not only more fluid will leave out of the capillaries, 
more white blood cells will be able to come out of the, of the circulatory system and go into the tissue fluid, and that's very important because the white blood cells are the ones that are sort of dominating our pathogens. And so what, it, what happens? Inflammation is swelling. As you can see here, there's redness. There's sometimes some pain with that and some heat. So this is all the sort of macro physical characteristics of an inflammatory response. But let's go into a little bit of, of detail. Um, it's not a lot of detail. This is actually just an overview, but, but, but I think it's kind of interesting. It's useful. So say we get a, a, a splinter or something like this, or a foreign object able to like penetrate the epidermis of our skin. Now, generally these types of things, like if it's a stick or something like that, there's all kinds of, you can't see it, but there's all kinds of germs on this. And so this is going to be something that introduces germs uh, past the first line of defense. And so check this out. So here it is. And here's our, here's our little germs that are on the stick. And so now the bacteria have penetrated the epidermis. And so you're like, uh-oh, now they're inside. What's going to happen? Well, this is, it looks busy and it is busy. It's sort of like a battlefield right here. It's like this big war raging uh, in the dermis of, this, of the skin. And what's interesting is this is a, a capillary. Now, of course, capillaries are found in the dermis. And so it's like, well, what's going to happen? Let's sort of walk through this. And so the damaged tissues, so the skin cells are, are ruptured. Some of them are destroyed. Some of these upper ones are dead anyway. But when the cells are broken open, they, if you can see this, they release a very popular chemical called histamine. And so this, these histamine chemicals are kind of generically referred to as chemokines. They're chemicals that will cause uh, other um, cells to come to an area. In other words, like chemical movement. And what will happen is the histamine in general causes the capillary walls to become more leaky. And this is again, vasodilation. And so what, not only will fluid leave, the, the plasma will leave into the area causing swelling, but it'll also cause white blood cells to come out of the blood and get into the battle scene. Now, what are these? These are the neutrophils, these are the monocytes, the big eaters. And what they do is that when they come out in here, they're going to be phagocytizing or engulfing these bacteria and destroying them. Okay, And then again, what you also want to have occur is some platelets come into an area and they also sort of help to seal to make sure that the bacteria aren't really getting into the bloodstream. And so it keeps the, keeps the wound kind of localized as well. And so that's kind of interesting. That's, a, that's an overview. So as I mentioned, a uh, major chemical is, is histamine. Now, you may have taken an antihistamine sometime in your life or you, even recently. Like, for example, if you have a cold or something, you're, the mucous membranes are secreting a lot of uh, a mucus. And again, that's what we're talking about. That water comes from the, the uh, movement of plasma into the tissue. And so, again, inflammation is a good thing. But sometimes if we're having a response, an inflammatory response to something that's not dangerous, like, for example, if we have an allergy to pollen, then an antihistamine can be taken, which reduces the production of histamine and therefore uh, less of those um, symptoms. Now, who's releasing the histamines? Well, uh, the uh, white blood cell called the basophil produces a lot of histamines and also mast cells. This is a common cell in connective tissue. So this is a, mast cells are found back in, in the connective tissue right in here, so I can draw one in. A mast cell is secreting uh, histamine and also a basophil is secreting that. And both of those trigger uh, increased permeability of blood vessels. Along with the tissues themselves that are damaged, secrete these hormone-like chemicals called prostaglandins that help uh, promote blood flow to the area. And so all of this, histamines and prostaglandins are really just trying to make the vessels more permeable to allow uh, more fluid, more white blood cells to come to the area so that uh, you can have uh, phagocytosis to occur. Okay, and so I thought I'd include this picture. I found this, I find it kind of interesting. It's like the old Jaws poster uh, is the phagocytes coming up to dominate. <laughs> and so neutrophils are 
fast and they're numerous and they're usually the first ones to arrive on the scene and then the monocytes will come. And, uh, and as a result of this, you might be familiar with this symptom as well. And in addition to red, redness and swelling and pain and heat, sometimes you'll see some pus and you're like, what is that? The pus is sort of the uh, dead phagocytes that are in the fluid that is, that is leaking out of the capillary and some of the proteins of the tissue fluid. And so it's a result of, um, although kind of gross, it's a result that things are, are working out really well in terms of the uh, in inflammation. Now, again, just to sort of move along to uh, other types of nonspecific defenses, fever is something is, I think we're all familiar with this, is that our body increases its temperature. And as a result of increasing temperature, it slows down bacteria's ability to divide. And it also encourages our white blood cells to be more active. And so again, it's kind of odd sometimes because a fever is not some, a pleasurable thing. We often take medication to reduce fever, and I'm not sure if that's altogether a good thing. We also take uh, antihistamines, which again, I'm not sure is altogether the best thing. And so um, fever helps to uh, contribute to defense uh, nonspecifically. Now, what happens if there's too much inflammation? Now, there's some bacterial infections that, that will, you know, and also some allergens that will cause something called septic shock. And so there's so much bacteria that it'll, and, and there's such a high fever that it, all of our blood vessels become super uh, dilated. And so all this fluid is, is occurring. It's not just local, it's throughout the body. And so would, that'll result in low blood pressure. And that can actually um, cause the, the patient to pass out and all and die in, in some instances. And so while local inflammation is essential, you don't really want this sort of widespread um, septic shock to occur. And so I hope that was clear. It was kind of a brief discussion of that. And then um, finally, in our bloodstream, in the plasma, we have proteins that are circulating of many different kinds. So we have antibodies, we have uh, albumins, we have fibrinogen, all, the, all kinds of proteins. We also have a series of proteins called complement. Now, this will be explained a little bit more in a separate vid video, but when a pa this is the cell membrane of a bacteria, let's say. And so what's interesting is we have these proteins called antibodies that will attach to the surface proteins of a foreign agent, and as a result of it, these complementary proteins will then accumulate on and attach to the antibodies, and then they jump off and they form transport proteins, which will allow for the cell to then lysis. More water will then enter into the cell, and the cell will actually be destroyed as a result of this. And so this complement system is um, associated with nonspecific and also actually specific immunity as well. And then finally, uh, we've determined that cells that are being invaded by viruses can secrete a, a type of protein called an interferon. And the name it sort of implies it sort of interferes with future spreading. And so it seems to be beneficial that cells that are, that are in, infected by this, by a virus, will secrete interferon, which will then cause other cells to be resistant to, to viral infection. And so this was um, when this was first discovered a few decades ago, there, it was thought to be like, wow, this is, could be really, really important. And so the genes were located for this interferon protein, and they were using biotechnological recombinant DNA. These were inserted into cells, and, and interferon proteins were mass-produced as sort of a wonder medication, but they still haven't really shown to be that effective. So more information needs to be learned about the, the importance of interferons. And so um, this is sort of the first line of defense. It's our mucous membranes, it's our skin, it's these, some of these are chemical, and of course, phagocytosis and inflammation and, and various proteins help to defend the body, all nonspecific. And again, this is sort of, if you wanted to, you could pause the video here. I won't necessarily go into all of this, but it, I kind of like this, this chart. It shows a little bit about how each of the things like that I've sort of touched on, 
the skin and interferon and phagocytosis inflammatory response. These are all examples in a summary of the nonspecific immune response. And then in a separate video, we'll talk specifically about our immune system. And this is how our body defends against specific organisms that they've seen once before. And the heart and soul of that are the lymphocytes themselves. And they secrete, in particular the B lymphocytes, secrete these proteins that circulate in the plasma uh, called aminoglobulins or antibodies. They're a type of gamma globulin which then attack foreign organisms. So I uh, hope you stay tuned for that. It's going to be a, a pretty interesting discussion. So hope you enjoyed the non-specific defense. There's a lot to it, but you would expect it because every single day our, uh, we're fighting off all of these pathogens and thank goodness all of this is happening. And I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. Thanks for watching.